We are delighted to be launching our mental health and well-being program as part of the People Health and during Mental Health Awareness Week. Our vision is to build awareness of mental health and partner with organisations to develop clinical intervention to address the issues. Talking about mental health feels taboo for many people. We feel our mental health is private and should stay that way. However, when we don't talk, mental health concern can become crises and this can significantly impact on our day-to-day -day life. Just like our physical health, mental health is part of our well-being. We all have mental health all of the time and we always will. It's completely normal to experience mental health and nothing to be ashamed of. So, What's the definition of mental health? And here on the slide we have the definition by WHO. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realises his or her own potential, can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to contribute to her or his community. So how common are mental health problems and certainly some stats that frighten me? One in four people will experience a mental health problem of some kind each year in England. So 25% of us will experience some kind of mental health problem in England. One in six people report experiencing a common mental health problem like anxiety, like depression, in any given week in England. And more than 16,000 people reported during the pandemic that they had been affected by their mental health. And this is from last year's data. So, some statistics around mental health. And we know that mental health issues, they're costly, they're common, but importantly, they can be curable. And here we have an infographic which has captured 10 of the probably most top statistics or most frightening statistics which I've summarised on the next slide in groups. And like I say, mental health issues are common, they're costly, but they can be curable. Some signs and symptoms and lost treatment opportunities include... 77 to 75% of people with mental health problems receive no treatment and that is both frightening and shocking. Almost 8% of people meet the criteria for depression and anxiety. Depression and anxiety being two of the top symptoms around mental health. And like I mentioned before, one in six people experience a common healthcare problem each week. Who and where do they affect, for example? 15% people experience mental health problems in the workplace. That's on top of mental health problems in their, their home surroundings and uh, amongst their sort of general day-to-day -day life, but 15% in the workplace. And frighteningly, Women are twice as likely to experience mental health problems at work. Something to really take note of when you're working with women in the environment. Then the economic burden, the economic cost, again staggering. 105 billion is the cost per year of mental health in the UK. 105 billion pounds of which 45 billion is the cost to the employers. Again, frightening, 45 billion is the cost to the employers. Nearly 18 million working days are lost due to work-related stress, depression and anxiety. 
A mental illness is the second largest burden on the healthcare system. 300,000 people lose their jobs with mental health problems. So there are huge opportunities, one of which if employers save £9 for every £1 they invest in mental health awareness, support and training. So those were statistics and now some warning signs and five of the top warning signs of mental health issues to be aware of is persistent paranoia, worry or anxiety, extreme changes in mood, long lasting sadness or irritability, social withdrawal and major changes in eating or sleeping patterns and I'll say a little bit more about these. So mental health concerns can often start off small, but without proper attention, they can develop into more serious mental health, health issues. And we should have a preventative approach to mental health and ensure our well-being is at the forefront of our minds, instead of being reactive only when we start to feel unwell. Early intervention is key to avoid a major concern turning into a crisis and of the five word warning, uh, warning signs persistent paranoia worry or anxiety all of us worry sometimes we feel anxious before big events such as exams or job interviews or unknown situations however once we're out of that situation our anxiety stops on its own and we feel fine Persistent paranoia, however, is worry and anxiety, which is different because they begin to leak into our everyday conversations and change our normal way of living. Increasing our mental health awareness helps us spot when these common feelings begin to grow into something less normal and more serious. So the second signal is extreme changes in moods. Mood changes happen and they are normal. We have good days, bad days, and learning to live with difficult days is part of building our resilience. Extreme changes in moods are different. We shouldn't swing from highs one moment to overwhelming feelings of sadness to the next, and often, too often. Lashing out at others over a trivial misunderstanding can also be an extreme sign of mood change. Then the third sign, long-lasting sadness or irritability. Many of us feel sad and all of us have moments of irritability, yet these are tied to specific events in our lives. We feel sad because of something tragic that happened. We feel irritated because of something specific. When sadness and irritability persists, however, for weeks, for months, this can be a sign of growing mental health problems and are a sign of declining mental health. The fourth sign, social withdrawal. Each person is different in how much social contact they prefer. Introverts get their energy from being alone with a book, hobby or watching a sunset. Extroverts, however, feel energised by the crowd at a concert, by the buzz in a meeting. When we notice someone withdrawing from social contacts they were previously comfortable with, however, we should pay attention. This could be a sign that something is triggering those feelings of loneliness and isolation and we should be open to looking for what may have caused them. And then fifthly, the major changes in eating or sleeping patterns. Much the same as the other four signs, our e eating, working and sleeping patterns are unique to us. They change and develop during our lives. However, when patterns suddenly change, 
we should investigate. Are we avoiding something? Are we feeling stressed about something? Are we turning to food or alcohol or emotional support? Getting enough sleep, water and food is essential for our well-being. So it's important to recognise when this change in behaviour or habits uh, happen. So really in conclusion about what we're doing, we have a mental health vision that we've been working on and pans out for the next 12 months. We already have ongoing research in the field, a study on the impact of mental health amongst the South Asian communities looking at attitude, symptoms, awareness of and accessibility to clinical and other interventions, or actually the lack of awareness of uh, accessibility to clinical and other interventions. We're working with CARIF, which is uh, an academic group looking at mental health. The outcomes that we, uh, People Health, want to actually in investigate and input into include being part of the government mental health policy reforms, which are currently ongoing. This would help us improve access to mental health services for our South Asian community. We also want to input into reforming the Mental Health Act, which uh, started in 2017 and there is now a white bill that's been published and there is a request from the government for input into that which we will be looking at. And then the second phase of our work and most importantly is that we want to develop clinical intervention studies amongst mental health sufferers in the South Asian communities. And some of these may look at music as a creative in an intervention. Well thank you for today and uh, I hope that this has actually given you some insights into mental health and uh, symptoms, signs and the work that we want to do at People Health. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tina Mystery, a clinical psychologist who will be again speaking on mental health and well-being, but her work is specifically targeted to impact on the South Asian community. So Dr. Tina Mystery, clinical psychology, welcome. South Asians that live in the UK come from the subcontinent of South Asia. The countries that make up this continent include Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Nepal. And in addition to this include Maldives, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, Bhutan and Afghanistan. In the UK, South Asians make up 4% of the total population. And of that number, Indians make up 1.45 million. That's 2.3%, Pakistanis 1.17 million, and Bangladeshis 451,000. So what are the mental health issues for South Asians living in the UK? The research is limited and patchy. However, we know that South Asian women in particular are more likely to report high levels of anxiety and depression. We also know that South Asian women are also higher risk of having suicidal ideation, attempts, thoughts and self-harm. And older South Asian men, in particular men from Pakistan, are also more likely to report high levels of anxiety and depression compared to the white British community. However, the problems are further deepened because South Asians are less likely to access mental health support. And there are many reasons why this is the case. South Asians are more likely to report that their stigma is a barrier for them to access support. Additional barriers include fear of what other people will think, log gya And this is linked to shame that people feel 
and also of how mental health, having a mental health diagnosis can impact on one's family's honour or name, also known as ISIP. So what are we seeing is an increase of South Asians being detained in compulsory hospital admissions for severe and enduring mental health problems. But the problem isn't one-sided. Research studies have found that GPs are more likely to prescribe medication to South Asians for mental health issues rather than give them access to talking therapies. Recent research has also highlighted that South Asians have a lack of trust of mental health services and that mental health services just don't get it. So what that means is that they're just not culturally sensitive. And add to this that there is a lack of support in languages other than English. South Asians have more risk factors that may lead to the development of a mental health issue. These risk factors are migration, the pressure to acculturate, which is when we feel we need to fit into the majority culture. And we are more likely to experience indirect and direct racism. And we are also more likely to experience financial struggles, which is linked to poor mental health. In addition to this, South Asians are more likely to experience poor physical health as well. So for example, heart disease and diabetes. What COVID has taught us in 2020, that racial inequalities do exist. The picture is complicated with multiple factors that influence our mental health. We need to see change. What is it that causes that feeling in our chests? The uncomfortable sensation that weighs our chests down and make us feel like we can't take those full, deep breaths. Three point eight percent of our population have experienced generalized anxiety disorders, or GADs, and three point four percent have experienced depression. In the past week alone, one in six people will have experienced a common mental health problem. So we've all experienced some form of anxiety in our lives, whether it was before a big decision, a wedding, something money related. It's something we're not unfamiliar with, and yet it's one of the most complex disorders that we're aware of. I've been living with anxiety for almost as long as I can remember. But it wasn't until five years ago that I became aware of it. Before I knew what these feelings were, I bottled them up and ignored the possibility of having them. Complacency, coupled with ignorance, was a huge factor in how I felt. A lot of these anxieties came from my feelings of self-worth or lack thereof. I always had the urge to do more with my life, but always felt like I wasn't capable. My first experience in a therapy setting was actually in a group. I was surrounded by people who suffered from deep depression, deeper anxiety than I thought I had. These people had experienced things like severe loss, suicidal thoughts. That led me to believe that I didn't belong there. To me, I thought my anxiety was this big compared to everybody else's. It was a feeling of guilt, a guilt that I didn't feel like I fit in with all these people. These people who clearly needed more attention than I did. Dr. Tina Mystery, a clinical psychologist based in Birmingham, England, likens this feeling to a guilt that we attach to the pain we've experienced. Is it a normal part of going through anxiety? What would you, kind of in your experience, what would you say? So guilt forms part of anxiety because if you, it, it, as you described it, you were saying that, you know, you feel anxiety mm. okay, within whatever certain situation that occurs. Yeah. I'd kept a journal since 2012, but I hadn't intended on it turning into a therapeutic outlet in which I could reflect. Initially, it was an outlet for me to note down ideas and thoughts for films or videos I wanted to make. As I continued to fill these little books up, I started to pick up subtle cues about my moods, how I would react to certain situations, but I still didn't have enough information. Although I was attending group therapy sessions, I wasn't getting out of them what was intended. Instead, my feelings of guilt and feeling like I didn't belong there outweighed my need to address my anxiety. It was as though I didn't feel as though I was worthy enough to be there. Anyone I spoke to about the anxiety and the group sessions didn't quite understand why I was attending the sessions. The consensus was because I seemed happy, it was a strange concept for me to even consider anything to do with counselling. 
I spoke with cognitive behavioral psychotherapist Hina Pancholi about this interesting concept of high functioning anxiety. Um, I think there must I think there's probably loads of reasons why people might cover up or look as if they're covering up anxiety. I think probably one of the biggest things that comes to mind is to avoid other people noticing how they're feeling. A really common sort of safety or coping behavior um, can be things like using humor, happiness. Um, sort of in a CBT point of view, what we would sort of call this is sort of overcompensating. After these group therapy sessions, I needed something more substantial. I'd started a new job, and I experienced what could be considered as my first anxiety attack. So my first anxiety attack um, was an interesting one. I remember, I remember like it happened yesterday. Um, I remember it specifically because it's, it's an experience that you tend not to forget and it's an interesting one. So I was walking to work at the time and I was fine generally. I mean, I had the underlying sense of anxiety as I always do walking to work and I was listening to music and all of a sudden two minutes from work I started to feel my heart just beating really hard and I could just I could feel it I could actually feel it and I've never really felt my heart beat like that before. It was the first time I'd experienced anything like that. I remember standing in that work bathroom literally asking myself why am I crying? I had no idea why it was happening. Straight after this, I remember speaking to my manager who told me about the counselling service and how it worked. What I found after a cathartic five sessions was that I was able to finally articulate myself emotionally in a way that I wasn't able to before. We aren't as fragile as we think we are. As humans, we've shown ourselves to be resilient, patient and resourceful. And we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. We have the capacity to do incredible things through an insurmountable level of adversity. Getting rid of anxiety or mental health issues shouldn't be the goal. Changing our relationship with it and understanding that it's a part of us should be the focus. Being around people we love, things we enjoy doing, making ourselves happy. This is the point of life. Life isn't short. It's the longest thing you'll ever experience. What does your life look like a year from now? What do you picture yourself doing? Where are you? I couldn't picture myself being happy for the longest the time. Uh, and so far, so good. You, you having fun? It's still a struggle, but the outlook is looking good. I hope so. Is it on? It is on. Mike is on. 